Thank you very much for being here. We're going to begin with a uh, question from uh, one of the members in our town hall. Uh, each of you will have two minutes to respond to this question. Secretary Clinton, you won the coin toss, so you'll go first. Our first question comes from Patrice Brock. Patrice? Thank you, and good evening. The last presidential debate could have been no rated as MA, mature audiences, per TV parental guidelines. Knowing that educators assign viewing the presidential debates as students' homework, do you feel you're modeling appropriate and positive behavior for today's youth? Well, thank you. Are, are you a teacher? Um, yes, I think that that's a very good question because I've heard from lots of teachers and parents about some of their concerns about some of the things that are being said and done uh, in this campaign. Uh, and I think it is very important for us to make clear to our children that our country really is great because we're good. And we are going to respect one another, lift each other up. We are going to be looking for ways to celebrate our diversity. And we are going to try to reach out to every boy and girl as well as every adult uh, to bring them in to working on behalf of our country. I have a very positive and optimistic view about what we can do together. That's why the slogan of my campaign is Stronger Together. Because I think if we work together, if we overcome the divisiveness that sometimes sets Americans against one another, and instead we make some big goals, and I've set forth some big goals, getting the economy to work for everyone, not just those at the top, making sure that we have the best education system from preschool through college and making it affordable and so much else. If we set those goals and we go together to try to achieve them, there's nothing, in my opinion, that America can't do. So that's why I hope that we will come together in this campaign. Obviously, I'm hoping to earn your vote. I'm hoping to be elected in November. And I can promise you, I will work with every American. I want to be the president for all Americans, regardless of your political beliefs, where you come from, what you look like, your religion. I want us to heal our country and bring it together, because that's, I think, the best way for us to get the future that our children and our grandchildren deserve. Secretary Clinton, thank you. Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. Well, I actually agree with that. I agree with everything she said. Uh, I began this campaign because I was so tired of seeing such foolish things happen to our country. This is a great country. This is a great land. I've gotten to know the people of the country over the last year and a half that I've been doing this as a politician. I cannot believe I'm saying that about myself, but I guess I have been a politician. And my whole concept was to make America great again. When I watch the deals being made, when I watch what's happening with some horrible things like Obamacare, where your health insurance and health care is going up by numbers that are astronomical, 68 percent, 59 percent, 71 percent. When I look at the Iran deal and how bad a deal it is for us, it's a one-sided transaction where we're giving back $150 billion to a terrorist state, really the number one terrorist state. We've made them a strong country from really a very weak country just three years ago. When I look at all of the things that I see and all of the potential that our country has, we have such tremendous potential, whether it's in business and trade where we're doing so badly. Last year, we had an almost $800 billion trade deficit. In other words, trading with other countries, we had an $800 billion deficit. It's hard to believe. Inconceivable. You say, who's making these deals? We're going to make great trade deals. We're going to have a strong border. We're going to bring back law and order. Just today, a policeman was shot, two killed, and this is happening on a weekly basis. We have to bring back respect to law enforcement. At the same time, we have to take care of people on all sides. We need justice. But I want to do things that haven't been done, including fixing and making our inner cities better for the African-American citizens that are so great, and for the Latinos, Mr. Hispanics. And uh, I look forward to doing it. It's called Make America Great Again. Thank you, Mr. Trump. The question from Patrice was about, are you both modeling positive and appropriate behaviors for today's youth? We received a lot of questions online, Mr. Trump, about the tape that was released on Friday. As you can imagine, you called what you said locker room banter. 
He described kissing women without consent, grabbing their genitals. That is sexual assault. You brag that you have sexually assaulted women. Do you understand that? No, I didn't say that at all. I don't think you understood what was said. This was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I apologize to my family. I apologize to the American people. Certainly, I'm not proud of it. But this is locker room talk. You know, when we have a world where you have ISIS chopping off heads, where you have, and frankly, drowning people in steel cages, where you have wars and, and horrible, horrible sights all over, where you have so many bad things happening. This is like medieval times. We haven't seen anything like this, the carnage all over the world. And they look and they see. Can you imagine the people that are frankly doing so well against us with ISIS? And they look at our country and they see what's going on. Yes, I'm very embarrassed by it. I hate it. But it's locker room talk and it's one of those things. I will knock the hell out of ISIS. We're going to defeat ISIS. ISIS happened a number of years ago in a vacuum that was left so, because of bad judgment. And I will tell you, I will take care of ISIS. So Mr. And Trump, we should get on to much more important things and much bigger things. Just for the record, though, are you saying that what you said on that bus 11 years ago, that you did not actually kiss women without consent or grope women without consent? I have great respect for women. Nobody has more respect for women than I do. So for the record, said, you're saying you never did that? things that, frankly, you, you hear these things, I said, and I was embarrassed by it, but I have tremendous respect for women. Have you ever and done those women things? women have respect for me, and I will tell you, no, I have not, and I will tell you that I'm going to make our country safe. We're going to have borders on our country, which we don't have now. People are pouring into our country, and they're coming in from the Middle East and other places. Uh, we're going to make America safe again. We're going to make America great again, but we're going to make America safe again. And we're going to make America wealthy again, because if you don't do that, uh, it just, and it sounds harsh to say, but we have to build up the wealth of Thank our you, nation. Mr. Trump. Right now, other nations are taking our jobs and they're taking our wealth. Thank you, Mr. And that's Trump. what I want to talk about. Secretary Clinton, do you want to respond? Well, like everyone else, I've spent a lot of time thinking over the last 48 hours um, about what we heard and saw. You know, with prior Republican nominees for president, I, I disagreed with them. Um, politics, policies, principles, but I never questioned their fitness to serve. Donald Trump is different. I said starting back in June that he was not fit to be president and commander in chief. And many Republicans and independents have said the same thing. What we all saw and heard on Friday was Donald talking about women, what he thinks about women, what he does to women, and he has said that the video doesn't represent who he is, but I think it's clear to anyone who heard it that it represents exactly who he is, because we've seen this throughout the campaign. We have seen him insult women, we've seen him rate women on their appearance, ranking them from one to ten. We've seen him embarrass women on TV and on Twitter. We saw him, after the first debate, spend nearly a week denigrating a former Miss Universe in the harshest, most personal terms. So, yes, this is who Donald Trump is. But it's not only women, and it's not only this video that raises questions about his fitness to be our president because he has also targeted immigrants, African Americans, Latinos, people with disabilities, POWs, Muslims, and so many others. So this is who Donald Trump is, and the question for us, the question our country must answer, is that this is not who we are. That's why, to go back to your question, I want to send a message, we all should, to every boy and girl, and indeed to the entire world, that America already is great, but we are great because we are good. And we will respect one another, and we will work with one another, and we will celebrate our diversity. These are very important values to me, because this is the America that I know and love. And I can pledge to you tonight that this is the America 
that I will serve if I'm so fortunate enough to become your president. And we want to get to some questions well, from online. Well, am I allowed online. to respond to that? I but, assume I am. Yes, you can respond to that. It's just words, folks. It's just words. Those words, I've been hearing them for many years. I heard them when they were running for the Senate in New York, where Hillary was going to bring back jobs to upstate New York, and she failed. I've heard them where Hillary is constantly talking about the inner cities of our country, which are a disaster education-wise, job-wise, safety-wise, in every way possible. I'm going to help the African Americans. I'm going to help the Latinos, Hispanics. I am going to help the inner cities. She's done a terrible job for the African Americans. She wants their vote, and she does nothing. And then she comes back four years later. We saw that firsthand when she was a United States Senator. She campaigned where the Mr. primary Trump, part Mr. of her Trump, campaign. Mr. Trump, I want to get to audience questions and online questions. So she's allowed to do that, but I'm not allowed to respond. You're going to, have, you're going to get Sounds to respond fair. right now. It sounds fair. This tape is generating intense interest. In just 48 hours, it's become the single most talked about story of the entire 2016 election on Facebook, with millions and millions of people discussing it on the social network. As we said a moment ago, we do want to bring in questions from voters around the country via social media. And our first stays on this topic. Jeff from Ohio asks on Facebook, Trump says the campaign has changed him. When did that happen? So, Mr. Trump, let me add to that. When you walked off that bus at age 59, were you a different man or did that behavior continue until just recently? And you have two minutes talk, for as this. I told you, that was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I am a person who has great respect for people, for my family, for the people of this country. And certainly I'm not proud of it. But that was something that uh, happened. If you look at uh, Bill Clinton, far worse, minor words, and his was action. His was what he's done to women. There's never been anybody in the history of politics in this nation that's been so abusive to women. So you can say any way you want to say it, but Bill Clinton was abusive to women. Hillary Clinton attacked those same women and attacked them viciously, four of them here tonight. One of the women, who is a wonderful woman, at 12 years old, was raped at 12. Her client, she represented, got him off and she's seen laughing on two separate occasions, laughing at the girl who was raped. Kathy Shelton, that young woman, is here with us tonight. So don't tell me about words. I am absolutely, I apologize for those words. But it is things that people say. But what President Clinton did, he was impeached. He lost his license to practice law. He had to pay an 850000 dollar fine to one of the women, Paula Jones, who's also here tonight. And I will tell you that when Hillary brings up a point like that, and she talks about words that I said 11 years ago, I think it's disgraceful, and I think she should be ashamed of herself, if you want to know the truth. Can we please hold the applause? Secretary Clinton, you have two minutes. Well, first, let me start by saying that so much of what he's just said is not right, but he gets to run his campaign any way he chooses. He gets to decide what he wants to talk about. Instead of answering people's questions, talking about our agenda, laying out the plans that we have that we think can make uh, a better life and a better country, that's his choice. When I hear something like that, I am reminded of what my friend Michelle Obama advised us all. When they go low, you go high. And look, if this were just about one video, maybe what he's saying tonight would be understandable. But everyone can draw their own conclusions at this point about whether or not the man in the video or the man on the stage respects women. But he never apologizes for anything to anyone. He never apologized to Mr. and Mrs. Khan, the Gold Star family, whose son, Captain Khan, died in the line of duty in Iraq 
And Donald insulted and attacked them for weeks over their religion. He never apologized to the distinguished federal judge who was born in Indiana. But Donald said he couldn't be trusted to be a judge because his parents were, quote, Mexican. He never apologized to the reporter that he mimicked and mocked on national television and our children were watching. And he never apologized for the racist lie that President Obama was not born in the United States of America. He owes the president an apology, he owes our country an apology, and he needs to take responsibility for his actions and his words. Well, you owe the president an apology because, as you know very well, uh, your campaign, Sidney Blumenthal, he's another real winner that you have, and he's the one that got this started along with your campaign manager, and they were on television just two weeks ago, she was saying exactly that. So you really owe him an apology. You're the one that sent the pictures around your campaign, sent the pictures around with President Obama in a certain garb. That was long before I was ever involved, so you actually owe an apology. Number two, Michelle Obama. I've gotten to see the commercials that they did on you. And I've gotten to see some of the most vicious commercials I've ever seen of Mo Michelle Obama talking about you, Hillary. So you talk about, friend, go back and take a look at those commercials. A race where you lost, fair and square, unlike the Bernie Sanders race where you won, but not fair and square, in my opinion. And all you have to do is take a look at WikiLeaks and just see what they said about Bernie Sanders and see what Deborah Wasserman Schultz had in mind because Bernie Sanders between superdelegates and Deborah Wasserman Schultz, he never had a chance. And I was so surprised to see him sign on with the devil. But when you talk about apology, I think the one that you should really be apologizing for and the thing that you should be apologizing for are the 33,000 emails that you deleted and that you acid washed. And then the two boxes of emails and other things last week that were taken from an office and are now missing. And I'll tell you what, I didn't think I'd say this, but I'm going to say it, and I hate to say it, but if I win, I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, because there has never been so many lies, so much deception, there has never been anything like it. And we're going to have a special prosecutor. When I speak, I go out and speak, the people of this country are furious. In my opinion, the people that have been long-term workers at the FBI are furious. There has never been anything like this where emails and you get a subpoena, you get a subpoena, and after getting the subpoena, you delete 33 thousand emails and then you acid wash them or bleach them as you would say a very expensive process so we're going to get a special prosecutor and we're going to look into it because you know what people have been their lives have been destroyed for doing one fifth of what you've done and it's a disgrace and honestly you ought to be ashamed of Secretary yourself Clinton, no, i want to follow up on that i'm going to let you talk about it because everything he just said is absolutely false but i'm not oh, surprised really? in the first debate and we in the really, first the debate, audience needs to I calm told down people here. that it would be impossible to be fact-checking Donald all the time. I'd never get to talk about anything I want to do and how we're going to really uh, make lives better for people. So once again, go to HillaryClinton.com. We have literally Trump. You can fact-check him, fact -check, fact -check him in real time. Last time at the first debate, we had millions of people. Uh, fact-checking, so I expect we'll have millions more fact-checking uh, because, you know, it is, uh, it's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. We want to remind the audience to please not uh Talk out loud. Please do not applaud. You're just wasting time. And, and Secretary Clinton, I do want to follow up on emails. You've said your handling of your emails was a mistake. You disagreed with Director, FBI Director James Comey, calling your handling of classified information, quote, extremely careless. The FBI said that there were 110 classified emails that were exchanged, eight of which were top secret. 
and that it was possible hostile actors did gain access to those emails. You don't call that extremely careless? Well, Martha, first let me say, and I've said it before, but I'll repeat it because I want everyone to hear it. That was a mistake, and I take responsibility for using a personal email account. Uh, obviously, if I were to do it over again, I would not. I'm not making any excuses. Uh, it was a mistake, and I am very uh, sorry about that. But I think it's also important uh, to point out where there are some misleading accusations from critics and others. Uh, after a year-long investigation, there is no evidence that anyone hacked the server I was using. And there is no evidence that anyone uh, can point to at all, anyone who says otherwise has no basis, that any classified material ended up in the wrong hands. I take classified materials very seriously and always have. When I was on the Senate Armed Services Committee, I was privy to a lot of classified material. Obviously, as Secretary of State, I had some of the most important secrets uh, that we possess, such as going after bin Laden. Uh, so I am very committed to taking classified information seriously. And as I said, there is no evidence uh, that any classified information ended up in the wrong hands. Okay, we're going to move on. And yet, she didn't know the word, the letter C on a document. Right? She didn't even know what that word, what that letter meant. You know, it's amazing. I'm watching Hillary go over facts, and she's going after fact after fact, and she's lying again because she said she, you know, what she did with the emails was fine. You think it was fine to delete 33,000 emails? I don't think so. She said the 33,000 emails had to do with her daughter's wedding, number one, and a yoga class. Well, maybe we'll give three or three or four or five or something. 33,000 emails deleted, and now she's saying there wasn't anything wrong. And more importantly, that was after getting a subpoena. That wasn't before, that was after. She got it from the United States Congress. And I'll be honest, I am so disappointed in congressmen, including Republicans, for allowing this to happen. Our Justice Department, where her husband goes onto the back of an airplane for 39 minutes, talks to the Attorney General days before a ruling's gonna be made on her case. But for you to say that there was nothing wrong with you deleting 39,000 emails, again, you should be ashamed of yourself. What you did, and this is after getting a subpoena from the United States Congress. We have to move if on. You Secretary Clinton, that, you can respond second, and then we got to move on. We, we want to give the audience the a, a, sector, a chance you'd be put here. In jail, let alone after getting a subpoena from the United States Secretary Congress. Secretary Clinton, you can respond, then we have to move on to an audience question. Look. It's just not true, and so please you, oh, go you didn't to, delete them? You Allow didn't her to respond, please. Those personal emails, not oh, official. 33,000? Yeah, not, right. Well, we turned over 35,000, so oh, yeah. it was... What about the other 15,000? Uh, please allow her to respond. She didn't talk while you talked. Yes, that's true. I didn't. And I didn't in the say. first debate, and uh, I'm going to try not to in this debate, because uh, I'd like to get to the questions that the people have brought here tonight uh, to talk to us about. And get off this question. Okay, Donald, I know you're into big diversion tonight. Anything to avoid talking about your campaign and the way it's exploding and the way Republicans are leaving you. But let's, let's, let's at see least what focus on some response. of the let's issues see what that people care about tonight. Let's get to their question. We have a question here from Ken Karpowitz. He has a question about health care. Ken? I'd like to know, Anderson, why aren't you bringing up the emails? I'd like to know. Why aren't you we getting brought up to the, the emails. bottom? No, it hasn't. It hasn't. And it hasn't been finished at all. Ken Karpowitz has a question. It's nice to one on three. Thank you. Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare, it is not affordable. Premiums have gone up, deductibles have gone up, co-pays have gone up, prescriptions have gone up, and the coverage has gone down. What will you do to bring the cost down and make coverage better? That, that first one goes to Secretary Thank Clinton you. because you started out the last one to the audience. He wants to start. He can start. No, go ahead, Donald. No, I'm a gentleman, Hillary. Go ahead. Secretary Clinton. Well, I think Donald was about to say he's going to solve it by repealing it and getting rid of uh, the Affordable Care Act. And I'm going to fix it because I agree with you. Premiums have gotten too high, co-pays, deductibles, prescription drug costs. And I've laid out a series of actions that we can take to try to get those costs down. 
But here's what I don't want people to forget when we're talking about reining in the cost, which has to be uh, the highest priority of the next uh, president. When the Affordable Care Act passed, it wasn't just that 20 million people got insurance who didn't have it before, but that in and of itself was a good thing. I meet these people all the time and they tell me what a difference having that insurance meant to them and their families. But everybody else, the 170 million of us who get health insurance through our employers got big benefits. Number one, insurance companies can't deny you coverage because of a pre-existing condition. Number two, no lifetime limits, which is a big deal if you have serious health problems. Number three, women can't be charged more than men for our health insurance, which is the way it used to be before the Affordable Care Act. Number four, if you're under 26 and your parents have a policy, you can be on that policy until the age of 26, something that didn't happen before. So I want very much to save what works and is good about the Affordable Care Act. But we've got to get costs down. We've got to provide some additional help to small businesses so that they can afford uh, to provide health insurance. But if we repeal it, as Donald has proposed, and start over again, all of those benefits I just mentioned are lost to everybody, not just people who get their health insurance on the exchange. And then we would have to start all over again. Right now, we are at 90% health insurance coverage. That's the highest we've ever been in our country. Secretary Clinton, so I time's want us up. to get to 100%, but get costs down and keep quality up. Mr. Trump, you have two minutes. It is such a great question, and it's maybe the question I get almost more than anything else outside of defense. Obamacare is a disaster. You know it. We all know it. It's going up at numbers that nobody's ever seen worldwide. It's nobody's ever seen numbers like this for health care. It's only getting worse. In 17, it implodes by itself. Their method of fixing it is to go back and ask Congress for more money, more and more money. We have right now almost $20 trillion in debt. Obamacare will never work. It's very bad, very bad health insurance, far too expensive. And not only expensive for the person that has it, unbelievably expensive for our country. It's going to be one of the biggest line items very shortly. We have to repeal it and replace it with something absolutely much less expensive and something that works where your plan can actually be tailored. We have to get rid of the lines around the state, artificial lines, where we stop insurance companies from coming in and competing because they want, and President Obama and whoever was working on it, they want to leave those lines because that gives the insurance companies essentially monopolies. We want competition. You will have the finest health care plan there is. She wants to go to a single payer plan, which would be a disaster, somewhat similar to Canada. And if you ever notice, the Canadians, when they need a big operation, when something happens, they come into the United States in many cases because their, their system is so slow. It's it's catastrophic in certain ways. But she wants to go to single payer, which means the government basically rules everything. Hillary Clinton has been after this for years. Obamacare was the first step. Obamacare is a total disaster. And not only are your rates going up by numbers that nobody's ever believed, but your deductibles are going up. So that unless you get hit by a truck, you're never going to be able to use it. Mr. Trump, it is time. a disastrous plan, and it has to be repealed and replaced. Secretary Clinton, let me follow up with you. Your husband called Obamacare, quote, the craziest thing in the world, saying that small business owners are getting killed as premiums double, coverage is cut in half. Was he mistaken, or was his mistake simply telling the truth? No, I mean, he clarified what he meant, and, and it's very clear. Look, we are in a situation in our country where if we were to start all over again, we might come up with a different system. But we have an employer-based system. That's where the vast majority of people get their health care. And the Affordable Care Act was meant to try to fill the gap between people who were too poor and couldn't put together any resources to afford health care, namely people on Medicaid, Obviously, Medicare, which is a single-payer system, which takes care of our elderly and does a great job doing it, by the way. And then all the people who were employed, but people who were working but didn't have the money to afford insurance and didn't have anybody, an employer or anybody else, to help them. 
That was the, the slot that the Obamacare uh, approach was to take. And like I say, 20 million people now have health insurance. So if we just rip it up and throw it away, what Donald's not telling you is, we just turn it back to the insurance companies the way it used to be. And that means the insurance companies get to do pretty much whatever they want, including saying, look, I'm sorry, you've got diabetes, you had cancer, your child has asthma. Your time is up. You may not be able to have insurance because you can't afford it. So let's fix what's broken about it, but let's not throw it away and give it all back to the insurance companies Mr. and let the Let me follow companies. up with you, Mr. That's not going to work. Mr. Trump, let me follow up uh, well, on I this. I just wanted just one thing. First of all, Hillary, everything's broken about it, everything. Number two. Bernie Sanders said that Hillary Clinton has very bad judgment. This is a perfect example of it, trying Trump, to save Obamacare, which is... You've said you want to end Obamacare. Way, you've said you want to end Obamacare. You've also said you want to make coverage accessible for people with pre-existing conditions. How do you force insurance companies to do that if you're no longer mandating that every American get insurance? Able to. You're going to have plans. What, what does that mean? That, well, I'll tell you what it means. You're going to have plans that are so good because we're going to have so much competition in the insurance industry once we break out once we break out the lines and allow the competition to come president are you, obama are you going to have a mandate that americans Anderson, have to have health insurance me. president obama by keeping those lines the boundary lines around each state and it was almost gone until just very toward the end of the passage of obamacare which, by the way, was a fraud. You know that. Because Jonathan Gruber, the architect of Obamacare, was said, he said it was a great lie. It was a big lie. President Obama said, you keep your doctor, you keep your plan. The whole thing was a fraud, and it doesn't work. But when we get rid of those lines, you will have competition, and we will be able to keep pre-existing. We'll also be able to help people that can't get don't have money because we are going to have people protected and republicans feel this way believe it or not and strongly this way we're going to block grant into the states we're going to block grant into Med medicaid into Thank the you, states Trump. so that we will be able to take care of people without the necessary funds to take care of themselves thank you mr trump we now go to gorba hamid with a question for both candidates all right there are 3.3 million Muslims in the United States, and I'm one of them. You've mentioned working with Muslim nations, but with Islamophobia on the rise, how will you help people like me deal with the consequences of being labeled as a threat to the country after the election is over? Mr. Trump, you're first. Well, you're right about Islamophobia, and that's a shame. But one thing we have to do is we have to make sure that because there is a problem. I mean, whether we like it or not, and we can be very politically correct, but whether we like it or not, there is a problem. And we have to be sure that Muslims come in and report when they see something going on. When they see hatred going on, they have to report it. As an example, in San Bernardino, many people saw the bombs all over the apartment of the two people that killed 14 and wounded many, many people. Horribly wounded, they'll never be the same. Muslims have to report the problems when they see them. And, you know, there's, a, there's always a reason for everything. If they don't do that, it's a very difficult situation for our country. Because you look at Orlando, and you look at San Bernardino, and you look at the World Trade Center, go outside, you look at Paris, look at that horrible, these are radical Islamic terrorists. And she won't even mention the word, and nor will President Obama. He won't use the term radical Islamic Terrorism. Now, to solve a problem, you have to be able to state what the problem is, or at least say the name. She won't say the name, and President Obama won't say the name, but the name is there. It's radical Islamic terror. And before you solve it, you have to say the name. Secretary Clinton. Well, thank you for asking your question, and I've heard this question from a lot of Muslim Americans across our country. because. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of very divisive, dark things said about Muslims. And even someone like Captain Khan, the young man who sacrificed himself defending our country in the United States Army, has been subject to attack by Donald. I want to say just a couple of things. First, we've had Muslims in America since George Washington. And we've had many successful Muslims. We just lost a particularly well-known one with Muhammad Ali. My vision of America is an America where everyone has a place, 
If you're willing to work hard, you do your part, you contribute to the community, that's what America is. That's what we want America to be for our children and our grandchildren. It's also very short-sighted and even dangerous to be engaging in the kind of demagogic rhetoric that Donald has about Muslims. We need American Muslims to be part of our eyes and ears on our front lines. I've worked with a lot of different Muslim groups around America. I've met with a lot of them and I've heard how important it is for them to feel that they are wanted and included and part of our country, part of our homeland security. And that's what I want to see. It's also important, I intend to defeat ISIS, to do so in a coalition with majority Muslim nations. Right now, a lot of those nations are hearing what Donald says and wondering, why should we cooperate with the Americans? And this is a gift to ISIS and the terrorists, violent jihadist terrorists. We are not at war with Islam. And it is a mistake and it plays into the hands of the terrorists to act as though we are. So I want a country where citizens like you and your family are just as welcome as anyone else. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. Mr. Trump, in December, you said this. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. We have no choice. We have no choice. Your running mate said this week that the Muslim ban is no longer your position. Is that correct? And if it is, was it a mistake to have a religious test? First of all, Captain Khan is an American hero. And if I were president at that time, he would be alive today. Because unlike her, who voted for the war without knowing what she was doing, I would not have had our people in Iraq. Iraq was a disaster. So he would have been alive today. The Muslim ban is something that in some form has morphed into a extreme vetting from certain areas of the world. Hillary Clinton wants to allow and, and why did thousands. it morph excuse into me, that? No, me. did you? No, answer the question. Why do you, you still believe? Her? You I do. Me all the time. Why don't you Would interrupt you please her? explain whether or not the Muslim ban still stands? It's called extreme vetting. We are going to areas like Syria where they're coming in by the tens of thousands because of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton wants to allow a 550% increase over Obama. People are coming into our country like we have no idea who they are, where they're from, what their feelings about our country is, and she wants 550% more. This is going to be the great Trojan horse of all time. We have enough problems in this country. I believe in building safe zones. I believe in having other people pay for them. As an example, the Gulf states who are not carrying their weight, but they have nothing but money and take care of people. But I don't want to have, with all the problems this country has and all of the problems that you see going on, hundreds of thousands of people coming in from Syria when we know nothing about them. We know nothing about their values and we know nothing about their love for our country. And Secretary Clinton, let me ask you about that, because you have asked for an increase from 10 to 65,000 Syrian refugees. We know you want tougher vetting. That's not a perfect system. So why take the risk of having those refugees come into the country? Well, first of all, I will not let anyone into our country that I think poses a risk to us. But there are a lot of refugees women and children. Think of that picture we all saw of that four-year-old boy with the blood on his forehead because he'd been bombed by the Russian and Syrian air forces. There are children suffering in this catastrophic war, largely, I believe, because of Russian aggression. And we need to do our part. We by no means are carrying anywhere near the load that Europe and others are. But we will have vetting that is as tough as it needs to be from our professionals, our intelligence uh, experts, and others. But it is important for us as a uh, policy, you know, not to say, as Donald has said, we're going to ban people based on a religion. How do you do that? We are a country founded on religious freedom and liberty. 
How do we do what he has advocated without causing great distress within our own country? Are we going to have religious tests when people fly into our country? And how do we expect to be able to implement those? So I thought that what he said was extremely unwise and even dangerous. And indeed, you can look at the propaganda on a lot of the terrorist sites. And what Donald Trump says about Muslims is used to recruit fighters because they want to create a war between us.